The evidence is really very strong that when sleep gets short, waistline can expand. After hearing this nine years ago, my perspective on sleep totally changed. I found that if I slept poorly, my hunger and cravings doubled, the portions I ate also doubled, and I'd be 30% more likely to store them as fat. Combine all of this and it was like I was trying to canoe up a river against the current. Getting better sleep is what I needed to position myself with the current so I could get to my goal weight more easily and faster. But if you're like me, that's easier said than done. Revenge bed procrastination, laying in bed awake even when I do go to bed on time, and interrupted sleep after a 2 a.m. pee were some of the main reasons my sleep quality looked like the stock market ticker. But there was no way I was going to make things five times harder on myself when weight loss is already super hard. So I dug into more than 100 books, podcasts, and videos on sleep from neuroscientists, psychotherapists, sleep medicine specialists, and naturopaths. I tried and tested 33 different sleep hacks, recording how each impacted my sleep and weight loss. And after many combinations and permutations of hacks, I discovered it all boils down to three principles that you can use to build your routine starting tonight and make weight loss 80% easier and faster starting tomorrow. I call the first principle, empty your cup. No, 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 not like that. This is an old Chinese saying attributed to a conversation between a scholar and a master. The scholar who came to the master to learn was full of knowledge and opinions about the world. As he kept talking about what he knew, the master started filling his cup with tea and kept pouring even after the cup overflowed. The scholar saw this and exclaimed, stop, my cup is full. The master said, exactly, you are like this cup, full of ideas. I can't teach you anything. You have to first empty your cup. We are all like that overflowing cup by the time evening rolls around. For me, if I couldn't complete all the work I had planned for the day, I'd feel resistant to even ending work. I would think one more hour, then 30 more minutes, then five minutes more, which was such a blatant lie. I cannot believe I fooled myself every single time. And then of course, by the time I'd get home, I'd be so tired. My willpower around food would be near zero. And when bedtime rolled around, I'd feel I never got any time for myself. So I'd stay up scrolling social media late into the night, sleeping late, waking up groggy, working inefficiently because of being tired. So I again don't finish everything I planned and the whole cycle keeps spiraling and spiraling. I'd keep thinking I need to find some me time before bed, but also felt helpless to stop this cycle from happening over and over again. The problem was I had no room left to add me time because my cup was already overflowing. I needed to empty my cup first. I do this by blocking in my calendar the last half hour of work to reflect and plan. There are three parts to this. First is the setup. I spot in my calendar two to four hours of consecutive time that tend to be available each day of the week. I proactively block out those times to discourage coworkers from booking any meetings during it. I call this my deep work time. I also use app blockers to schedule ahead blocking all distracting sites and apps during deep work. Second, during my half hour reflect and plan time, I look at the work that's left and I identify the one most important thing to complete tomorrow. Then I open my calendar for the next day and check how much of my deep work time is still available. I then trim the one most important thing until I estimate it can be done within half the deep work time. The other half is buffer time for surprises. And lastly, with my next day planned, I answer two to three questions. One, did I get what I wanted done? Two, if not, what was the one barrier that got in the way and what is my mitigation for it tomorrow? And three, what bothered or excited me about today and why? Even if the mitigation doesn't work or I get the estimation of the one most important thing wrong, as long as I stick to this practice, I notice my mind is empty after those 30 minutes, which means I now actually have space for me time. So when bedtime rolls around, I feel satisfied with my day, get great sleep and crush hunger cravings and weight loss, right? Uh, no. My downtime would sometimes be hanging out with friends, which means eating, drinking, and then inexplicably, I'd find myself waking up between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. completely alert. Sometimes this would happen right after an excursion to the bathroom, sometimes just for no reason. I am awake. If instead of hanging out, I had some solo me time, I'd watch a TV show or scroll social media, all of which I totally enjoy, but then find myself having a really hard time stopping. Honestly, embarrassing when Netflix asks for the third time, are you still watching? Yes, Netflix, I have no self-control. Or TikTok, it's impossible to stop. I start on one video, blink, and it's eight hours later. And I'd be back to square one, going to bed late, waking up groggy, and hunger and cravings still making weight loss hell. The problem was I emptied my cup to remove the mental stimulation that had accumulated over the day, but then I filled my cup back up with mental stimulation and cranked it up to the extreme. Think about it. 
Which is more stimulating, work or TV? Eating a just right sized home cooked meal or going all out for dinner? I had emptied my cup only to fill it with the same stuff but on steroids. But if I jumped straight to mindfulness activities like meditation or breath work, I'd find my mind still wandering back to work or glancing at my phone. And let's be honest, these felt so boring that most nights I couldn't even make myself start them. The problem is going from work to meditation is like treating our minds like an on-off switch when it's more like a dimmer. We need to pass through the middle part of the slider before we can be ready for the lowest levels of stimulation that mindfulness is. This transition is done by refilling my empty cup with activities that make me inhabit my body. And I do this gradually. The first thing I do after my plan and reflect time is to go for a 30 minute leisurely walk during which I can sit and scroll social media or listen to podcasts. This allows me fun screen time, but also time boxes it. I set an alarm to return home or even better, have a dinner date commitment to make sure I return in 30 minutes. This earlier dinner allows for at least a three hour gap between my eating and sleep. Bye bye digestion activities causing random midnight alertness and bye bye midnight trips to the bathroom. Then I fill my cup with things that get me into my body instead of back into my mind. I do this nowadays with an hour long walk with friends on Monday, Wednesday and Friday evenings and online dance classes on Tuesday and Thursday evenings. The exact activity doesn't matter as long as it moves my body and I get totally sucked into it. And lastly, I schedule my longer screen times and big restaurant meals to happen on the weekends all before the time I'd plan and reflect if it were a work day. Yes, this means I mainly eat out on weekends for lunch because the bigger the meal, the more time is needed for digestion before sleep. And my big screen time and friend hangout is over by 5 p.m. AKA I have enough time to slide down the dimmer in time for bed. Now that I have tired myself out mentally and physically, you'd think when bedtime rolls around, I'd be ready for sleep. But there is still a final piece missing. The walks and dance classes are fun, but my adrenaline is still pumping. So when I lay down to sleep, I'd be physically tired, but also energized. You know what it feels like when you're tired, but can't fall asleep. It's the worst. The problem is my cup is still full of stimulation in the form of adrenaline, and I need to drain my cup to fall asleep. Most mindfulness activities fit the bill here. The game changer for me was to stack a combination together that I personally enjoy. And at the end of which I feel like I have been to a spa retreat. For me, this is a hot shower for 10 minutes, then foam roll and stretch for 15 minutes. And lastly, I settle into a cool bedroom with cool sheets. While in bed, I listen to a fiction audiobook on a phone in airplane mode with an app blocking everything but the Audible app. I like picking a book I have already read before and yet look forward to listening to again because then I don't end up staying awake all night to know how the story ends. And then as I start dozing off, I stop the audio using the controls on my headphones so I don't have to look at the screen at all. This is the power of implementing key dominoes. You knock the key domino down and you automatically knock down all the healthy choices you know you should make. This is why you don't want to ignore this video where I walk through the four key dominoes I knock down between waking up and end of work without which I couldn't have lost 20 pounds and kept it off these past eight plus years. So you don't want to miss the complete step-by-step -step breakdown here. And always remember, you can do it.